Well, good morning, folks. I am doing a video on the topic of Ash Wednesday for the folks at the First Congregational Church of Lincoln. They have chosen not to have in person today, partly because of COVID and partly because I would have been the speaker. We didn't know what the weather was gonna look like. And they thought if I did a video, um, on the topic of Ash Wednesday that they could uh, put that up for the folks to see and they would forego an in-person service tonight. So I'm coming to you from my little office in the upstairs corner of a little place on Beach Hill Pond and it is a joy for me to uh, be with you this morning. Um, Ash Wednesday uh, holidays and special occasions are certainly part of the American culture. Uh, we celebrate uh, all kinds of those types of activities, from uh, uh, New Year's Day to President's Day to Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Uh, we celebrate um, Mother's Day and Father's Day and Memorial Day and Independence Day and Labor Day. I mean, it's just all kinds of days that we celebrate throughout the year and they kind of guide our lives a little bit because oftentimes our schedules center around those types of activities. You know, I look forward to the summer. I look forward to the 4th of July celebrations. I look forward to being with family and uh, kind of my uh, first of July activities are centered around a holiday, a special occasion. And then we have those other types of activities like birthdays and anniversaries that we like to celebrate. And then of course, there's those additional special occasions like Super Bowl Sunday. And all of you football fans, you enjoy that day. You basketball fans, enjoy March Madness. We enjoy looking forward to summer vacations. We even look forward, or used to anyway, not maybe not so much right now, but Black Friday. Remember how important Black Friday was? That day after Thanksgiving when every store had all their specials and we'd go out shopping to get the best deals for Christmas. Well, uh, internet shopping's kind of diminished that emphasis a little bit, but Still, our lives uh, are centered a lot around holidays and special occasions. Even in our Christian circles, uh, our calendar uh, guides our, our lives a lot. In the Old Testament, God ordained a certain feasts and celebration as a way uh, to be reminded throughout the year of uh, uh, his uh, redemptive activity in our lives. And even though we're not in and under Old Testament economy for celebrating uh, some of those feasts that the nation of Israel did, there are still uh, things that we do in our and on our Christian calendar that are important to us. There is a liturgical calendar that a, a lot of uh, uh, churches uh, like to follow and celebrate. And then there are those who do not uh, emphasize so much the liturgical calendar, but they still have their special days and events that they like to celebrate. So there's a sense in which we all uh, have our emphasis in our Christian circles of things that we like to do on a regular basis. I think the important uh, thing to remember is that the liturgical calendar was developed at a time when we didn't have access to all of the materials that we have access to today. And it was a way of kind of uh, reminding us to stay on track throughout the year, emphasizing specific things at specific times. Um, Certainly, in today's economy, we have a lot of access to devotional materials, to uh, scripture reading aids, to uh, prayer reminders. Uh, we have a lot of that today. And so sometimes we have a 
we might be less likely to follow a liturgical format. But for those churches that do, that's fine. There's no right or wrong here. It just need to, we just need to be reminded that it's not a external activity that confirms our relationship with God concerning salvation. That's that's totally and thoroughly and only in our faith in Christ. Our activity level in our churches is part of what we do as a result of knowing Christ as our Savior. In fact, when Paul was writing to the Colossians, and there was a lot of uh, false teaching going on, that were trying people that were trying to convince the Colossian believers that they needed to continue in some of the religious activities and celebrations of the Old Testament if they were going to truly be right with God. And Paul said, no, 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 that's not true. And in writing to the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, let me go back to verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. That's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he said in verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Paul says it's not about the rituals. It's not about the routines. It's not about the activities. It's about our faith in Christ and our relationship to God through him. And he said all of those uh, religious activities, those, those uh, rituals, those routines, those festivals, those new moons, those Sabbaths, they were just a shadow. They were just pointing to something of substance. And that something of substance was the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, in the New Testament, we're under a different economy. It's uh, a, an economy of having faith in and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and following his commands and, and his guidelines uh, for a uh, faithful and fruitful relationship with him. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with doing uh, some of these uh, liturgical uh, calendar events, as long as we don't use them for a substitute in determining our uh, relationship with God. That's what we have to be careful of. What are some of those major events that are really emphasized in all churches to some degree, but especially in those who maybe are following a more liturgical format? The first one, or, or one of the first ones, would be Advent, which literally means coming. And uh, Advent um, takes place the, the four Sundays before Christmas, and it's in anticipation of the celebration of the coming of Jesus and remembering that he has promised that he'd come again. We celebrate the first Advent, which happened nearly 2,000 years ago, and we look forward to celebrating the second Advent uh, when Jesus returns as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then, of course, we celebrate Christmas. And in the West, we we celebrate Christmas on December the 25th, although that may not be the exact date of Jesus' birth and probably isn't. It gives us a focal point of a time to celebrate the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The day that Jesus uh, was born into the human race as a baby to begin a life, uh, a perfect life, so that he could die on a cross 33 and a half years later as the Lamb of God who could take away the sins of the world. So uh, Christmas has become uh, probably one of the uh, most celebrated uh, Christian and secular holidays in the West. And certainly we are reminded at Christmas time of Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, it was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. Uh, God wrapped himself in humanity, and he walked on this earth for three and a half years. 
And then there is uh, epiphany, which uh, uh, simply means a manifestation. And uh, some uh, celebrate uh, epiphany with more emphasis than others. Some believe that the Magi came 12 days after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Others believe that it was as much as a year and a half to two years later. And one of the reasons they believe that is because of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, which reads, And when they had come into the house, no longer a stable, they saw a young child, no longer a baby, with Mary. And his mother... Uh, and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him, and they opened their treasures, and they presented him uh, with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So many Bible scholars believe uh, that a, a year, year and a half, two years had gone by before uh, the Magi had arrived. Uh, I kind of lean towards that also. Um, and the other reason that I do is because if you remember when Herod uh, felt he'd been deceived by the Magi because they didn't come back by and report to him that he ordered uh, the slaughter of all two-year-olds and younger. And so it's like he wanted to make sure that that baby was included in the babies that would be slaughtered. And I think he believed that a, that child could be as much as two years old. So he ordered the slaying of the children two years of age and under. So for that reason and others, I tend to lean towards the uh, uh, year and a half to two years. Then we have Ash Wednesday, which is today. Ash Wednesday always comes on a Wednesday because it's 40 days before Easter, excluding Sundays. And it always comes on a Wednesday. And so uh, this is the celebration uh, Wednesday for Ash Wednesday. It is the beginning of Lent, and it is uh, the first day of the season of Lent, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday and lasts for 40 days leading up to Easter, as I said. And the purpose of Lent is to provide a solemn time of reflection and evaluation. Now, certainly there's nothing wrong with a solemn time on reflection and evaluation. And I have a bug. I have a, I have a bug that's flying around and he's bugging me. And so uh, we need to take care of this bug. Thank you. Now, <laughs> I hope that doesn't <laughs> interrupt you too much. You can smile, it's okay. Now, um, uh, Lent is, an, is, is fine to reflect upon uh, our lives, uh, our failings, our successes, our walk with God, but it shouldn't just be a short period of time in our calendar. It should be every day, all year long. And then we celebrate Palm Sunday, the start of what is called the Holy Week. It's the Sunday before Easter. It represents the Sunday that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, as prophesied in the Old Testament, and the crowd wave, waved and laid palm branches to welcome him. In fact, in my reading, uh, I believe I read it that it's the palm branches that you use this year that you burn next year for the ashes to be used on Ash Wednesday. So you see, I've done a little research and I've learned a couple of things. And then we have Good Friday, which remembers the day that Jesus was crucified. Holy Saturday, which is a reflection on the day that Jesus would have been uh, still in the tomb and going through whatever it is that he went through uh, from the time of his death to the time of his resurrection. There are some insights in the scriptures, but not a lot of detail. We do know that he suffered for the sins of the world. And then we have, of course, Easter Sunday, which celebrates the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And, and we, uh, we want to be reminded of that joyous time when 
when uh, Christians celebrate uh, the resurrection of their Savior. And it's such an important time that we don't celebrate that just once a year. We celebrate that every week. In fact, most Christian churches meet on on Sunday, which is Resurrection Day, rather than on the Sabbath, which was the Old Testament meeting day for the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, most churches are going to celebrate on Sunday, which is Resurrection, and each and every week we're going to remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grave couldn't contain him. Death couldn't hold him. And uh, in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate uh, Easter and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we do every day, because he lives, we live also. And then there's Penny, Pentecost Sunday, which is celebrated 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the day the Holy Spirit came uh, to dwell uh within the heart of the believer, and that is uh, Acts chapter 2, and that is what we believe is the first day of the church. And the church has been, uh, Jesus has been building his church now, made up of all born-again believers for 2,000 years. One of these days, the last soul to be saved before the trumpet sounds and the rapture of the church is going to take place. And certainly we're much, much closer today than we were 2,000 years ago. And then, of course, there's Trinity Sunday, which is the Sunday after Pentecost when we celebrate uh, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so there's a sense in which uh, um, the church uh, begins um, in the liturgical calendar. The Christian uh, calendar begins with the Advent, uh, the coming of the Son, and ends with Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit which Jesus called in John, uh, one just exactly like himself. The word is paraclete. Uh, it's not just another hymnal. It's the exact same hymnal. It's not another person. It's the same person. One God in three persons. That is a whole subject in and of itself, which I am not even going to attempt to address at this time. Or maybe any time. <laughs> Who can understand the Trinity? But I want to focus just now for a couple of minutes on Ash Wednesday. And what is Ash Wednesday? Well, as I said earlier, it's the first day of Lent. It, uh, it is the official uh, name is Day of Ashes. And it's so-called because of the practice of rubbing ashes on the forehead. And I remember as a child seeing people with ashes on their forehead as a younger person. I, I didn't understand it. And uh, my understanding is today that some people will even put the ashes in the form of a cross as representation of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for their sins. Uh, I'm not sure how extensive that 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 is practiced today. I know in my church experiences, uh, Ash Wednesday was, was not emphasized as a practice, as a liturgical practice, as part of the calendar of Christian activities throughout the year. Uh, but in some of your churches, First Congregational Church of Lincoln for one, uh, that has been practiced. And and as I said earlier, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, we are reminded that the Bible doesn't mention Ash Wednesday, nor does it uh, mention Lent. But there are examples of individuals who have in the past used uh, ashes as part of a mourning and a repentance uh, situation. If I was to go back to uh, Daniel um, chapter 3 and verses, uh, cha sorry, chapter 9, uh, beginning at verse 3, uh, I would read this. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession. 
And I said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Daniel went on to say, we've sinned and we've committed iniquity. We have done wickedly, we have rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. And then it, and, and it says in, in, in verse, I, sorry, I started in verse four, but it says in verse three, I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, with sackcloth, and with ashes. So uh, there was a time in Daniel's life when there was a great deal of repentance uh, for the sinfulness of himself and his people. And he went before God to confess those sins, to repent of those sins, to call upon God's mercy to forgive those sins, and to cleanse them from their unrighteousness. And he mentioned prayer and fasting, sackcloth and ashes. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, God warns against using fasting as a manifestation in a way that manifests that this is what you're doing. God didn't want it to be an external show. He just wanted it to be a practical internal experience uh, whereby you and I would come <clears throat> to our Savior, to our God, and confess our sins. And so we have to be careful that we don't make our activities an external show and <clears throat> neglect the internal reality of what is supposed to be taking place. <clears throat> Excuse me. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, in the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. And my understanding of that Beatitude is those people are mourning because of sin. There's sorrow for sin. And that's what we need to do is we need to be sorrowful for our sins. And um, Jesus, when he stepped, it on, stepped on the pages of history in Matthew chapter 4, and verse 17, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so there needs to be an initial repentance for our sin and ask Jesus Christ to be our savior. And then that needs to be the ongoing repentance of sin the, uh, because we're sinners saved by grace and, and we sin by nature and by choice. And we need to keep short accounts with God. So even after we're saved, we need to be continually repenting and asking God for forgiveness of sin. We have sins of commission, things that we do we ought not to do, and we have sins of omission, things that we ought to do that we're not doing. So uh, in both situations, we have plenty to repent of. Um, so this... This uh, is a time to be encouraged to reflect and to remember. Um, the 1st of February, you remember we did communion together. And in taking you to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, in that passage of scripture, Paul says a man needs to examine himself so that he partakes in a worthy manner. You see, God wants us to be constantly reflecting upon our inner being to make sure that not only are we in a right relationship with God, but our walk with God is what it ought to be day by day. When John wrote to believers in 1 John chapter 1, he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. And he was writing to believers. So he was saying, you know, we need to be daily evaluating our lives and asking God to forgive us of our sins. So, it is fine to celebrate Ash Wednesday. It is fine to take this time and reflect upon our lives and ask God to show us anything in our lives that ought not to be there, anything that's not in our lives that ought to be there. And that's fine. And uh, But we need to be careful that it's just not an, 
an external emphasis without an internal reality. It needs to be something that we do on a regular basis, day in and day out. Always remembering who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. So I thank you for this opportunity to speak. I hope this is helpful to you. I hope you will benefit from it. First and foremost, we need to always be reminded that God loves us. Jesus died for us. He's on our side. He wants us to win. He asks us to evaluate our lives regularly. And if you want to take today, Ash Wednesday, to make it a special emphasis for you, if you want to do some things throughout Lent that causes you to reflect more seriously and solemnly on on your life and and your failings or your disappointments or things you want to change, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But just be reminded that we need to do this every day throughout our lives because we're in the process of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And one day we'll be like him for we will see him as he is. God bless you and may you continue to walk with your God in a way that honors and glorifies him. Amen.